great discussion. Great discussion being teed up. A um, couple of public service announcements, if you will. I'd be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity and I'll repeat them at the end as well. Um, hopefully other folks joining will be here. Uh, number one, our annual event. We are very excited to be back in person with the annual event open to the public this year and past years that have been invitation only. It will be at the newly remodeled Hard Rock Casino on September 16th. And we will, we will be recognizing a number of our industry peers for outstanding efforts in the field. Um, we'd love for you all to make some nominations for that and to get registered for the event. I'll put information on that in the chat here in a few minutes. Additionally, we are very excited to announce the launch of the IT Leadership Institute, a 10 month leadership course designed for the IT professionals to take you through one day a month, 8.30 to 11.30. The cohort will be working on a community project and walk you through leadership versus management, conflict, P&Ls, ROIs, hiring, interviewing, lots of great topics. So we're really excited about that. That will start, that cohort kicks off in October. There is limited seating. We're already about halfway full of uh, what we can accept in that. So nominate, get your folks in that program uh, as soon as you can. Uh, any of you that have been with us for a while know that we've done Momentum as a developers conference. Obviously we had to cancel last year. We will be back in person October 15th at the Hyatt. Uh, ticket sales for that just opened up this past week. So we're really excited. We had 160, I think, submissions for speakers for 30 speaker spots. So a lot of interest and the ability to pick some really great content. So uh, please share that with your development teams, clients, customers, um, prospects. Uh, for today's event, uh, this is a kind of a bonus event for our, our B Byte series that we offer. I want to thank ATC for being our sponsor for the series this year and for Centric um, bringing this great topic to us and bringing some of their key folks into the discussion today. Uh, we will be leveraging the chat feature. I suspect there will be a lot of questions, so I will be monitoring that. Please don't hesitate to use it. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Steve to introduce Centric and the, the Centric team, and we'll get started. Uh, thanks, Tracy, and thanks to the circuit for inviting us to talk about the topics around office optional and, and remote slash hybrid work environment. And this is not gonna be about centric, but it's more important that there's a lot of conversations going on around what does it mean to have a different office models in, the, in today's environment? Um, what impacts does it have? And what are the things that people need to be thinking about as they go about um, looking at what it means for their organization? And there's no right or wrong answer. I think it's what best fits their, their company. And so, <clears throat> Excuse me, the circuit reached out um, and Tracy reached out and talked about, hey, would, would Larry English uh, and or Centric like to, to talk a little about what it means um, to be office optional? Um, and it was um, kickstarted by you know, Larry's book called Office Optional, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but um, it's important just to make sure we're trying to share what we've learned over the past um, you know, months uh, working with other organizations, but also... Uh, lots of discussions with CHROs, CIOs, CEOs, et cetera, on what they're doing. Uh, so we're hoping to share some of that with everybody today. And we want to make sure that this is very collaborative um, throughout, the, uh, throughout the workshop and throughout the, the conversation. Um, but what we're going to talk about is a little bit about um, what is a hybrid workplace, why we want to consider it, building that culture and building that great hybrid re uh, remote model. And then how do you transition to a hybrid workplace? And again, we sprinkled Q&A throughout um, as far as pause points, but um, throw it out in the chat. Uh, like I said, we wanna make this very uh, collaborative back and forth and, and Tracy will sprinkle them in. Um, before I hand it over to kind of Larry, Steve and Joe, um, I think most everybody heard the success of Paycor yesterday uh, on their initial public offering. And I only bring this up because I was reading a interview with the CEO of Paycor. Um, and he actually addressed this specific topic about the organization. And I thought I'd just take 30 seconds and read it because I think it's relevant as we kind of jump into this as far as what organizations are thinking. But it says, like every company, we're managing employees as effectively as we can, trying to provide them choice in the return to work. 
we are a virtual first company. Our employees can choose whether they want to work from home or work from the office. It has enabled us to attract talent from across the country. It has enabled us to put our associates in a position where they're winning. They're getting to choose the work environment that best suits them and their families. And we think that's a winning formula for us. So I think that there's a lot of packed, uh, a lot of information packed just in that statement regarding all the areas of impact um, that hopefully we're going to address today. Um, so with that, I'm going to jump right into uh, handing it over to Larry uh, English, uh, who is the president of Centric. Thank you, Steve. Hi, everybody. Uh, I am president and co-founder of, of Centric. Uh, I'm one of the guys that came up with the idea initially 20 years ago of being remote and then ended up accidentally writing a book prior to the pandemic on how to be remote and have a great culture. And that has um, led me to accidentally end up with this new job of writing and speaking on the future of, of work. Um, but the people that really know what they're doing are Steve and Joe, and I'll let them introduce them, um, themselves. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Steve Jenkins, I'm leader of people in organizational change practice. I live in Columbus, Ohio, and uh, over the past Probably since last summer, for sure, we've been very intentional about focusing on enabling organizations uh, to work from anywhere and ultimately now moving to hybrid. So I'll turn it over to Joe. Thanks, Steve. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Joe Hartzell, um, also from the general Columbus area, I'll call it. Been with Centric here for about six years um, and I've had the pleasure of working with Steve on many occasions. Steve pays me to say that, by the way. Um, so um, I lead our national practice focused on enterprise collaboration, which really uh, means we help uh, organizations communicate and collaborate and work better together. And as you can uh, I'm sure understand as we've gone through this big change in the past year and a half, that's become a much larger factor for a lot of our uh, a lot of organizations and a lot of our clients. And so uh, Steve and I work very closely together as we help organizations make that transition from sort of that traditional workplace environment to uh, to this new world of hybrid work. Excellent. Go ahead, Steve. The next slide. So uh, let's let's talk about. Um, kind of our background. Um, we have been hybrid for 20 years. So we're kind of what we'd say digital natives. Um, and we did this, we started the company remote 20 years ago because we thought it would be uh, provide better work-life balance in our employees' lives and that they would be happier. And so we've known this secret for 20 years. Um, we figured out how to do it. And I kept having to explain it over and over again to all these companies because they didn't, they just like, they couldn't fathom how this possibly would work. So um, we could start to see that our client, the technology was getting better. Clients were becoming more okay with um, remote work. And so we thought this was the future of the work of work, but we just, we you know, we thought it was like 15 years out. So decided to write this book, went to my main partner and he's like, incredibly dumb idea, Larry, don't do it. Um, and I didn't listen to him, ended up writing it. And then the pandemic happened. And he was like, this is a great idea. Best idea you've ever had, Larry. Um, thanks for doing this. And so um, this was about 15 months ago. And I'm going to share some of the key concepts um, that we have in the book of how we figured out how to do it. Uh, but then more importantly, um, over the last 15 months, we've been helping a lot of organizations figure out that, um, how to adopt a hybrid model. And we've ended up um, developing kind of tools and accelerators. And we're going to share our lessons learned from all that uh, later on here. So go to the next slide there, Steve. So I think we're gonna do this a little bit low tech uh, and we're gonna enter, enter our answers in chat if I'm right, Tracy and Steve. Um, yeah. but we, we just wanted yeah, we'll, to get- we'll, we'll, we'll get a feeling for kind of what, what, the, uh, what most of the folks are going through currently. Great, so if you could take a few minutes and just respond to this, this question, we're trying to understand um, where your organization at is in the decision around a hybrid workplace. Is it, you know, yes, we're gonna do it, know um, what we're thinking about it. And then uh, the, the last one is, you know, absolutely, we are going back into the office. We are not going to adopt a hybrid workplace. And we'll take a second and just kind of get a feel for it. At least the numbers I see coming in are very consistent. Excellent. Okay, we've got one. Great. All right, I think, 
um, based on what I was seeing, and you, um, Steve and Trace, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. The majority of people were going answering number one, uh, which is embracing a hybrid workplace. So that that'll help us kind of guide our comments um, as we're going forward. So, if you could go to the next slide, we just wanted to kind of start with a, a definition around hybrid workplace. Um, so some people are like, "Well, I've installed Zoom, I'm I'm done," you know. And the, um, obviously, oh, let's see, um, I'll, I'll, I can't quite read that that question, so I'll wait um, until we get to a Q and A. But we just wanted to level set with everybody um, to make sure everybody has the same definition around hybrid. And this is basically enabling your workforce to be effective and thrive in um, either a virtual or hybrid setting. And there's a lot of components you can see on the right-hand side of there. It's making sure your leaders know how to lead a work virtual workforce. It's the things that we're gonna talk about, how you maintain culture when everybody is spread out. Um, it is the, the tools and training your employees on how, on how to be remote. And of course, it's all the application and data are accessible via the cloud, which I, all the CIOs on this call would be very um, interested in. And learning to measure probably differently because you are virtual and keeping your pulse on the organization when you can't see everybody every day. Uh, and, then, and then finally, you're usually going to adjust your processes or digitize your processes um, and learn to work asynchronously. So there's a lot that's involved in the definition of hybrid. So I'll go on to the next slide there, Steve. So I, um, I'll, I'll share, this is meant to be the why, and I'm going to share the data that, that we're seeing. And it sounds like people are arriving at the same decision. So maybe I'll spend a little bit less time. These are statistics from two studies from McKinsey and Microsoft that came out in the last um, month. And um, what we, during the pandemic, we were seeing the internal polls that were going on and it was somewhere around 5% of employees in the companies we were working with wanted to go back into the office full time. And we're like, this is going to be a problem when we open back up. If um, companies force everybody back into the office, they're going to lose um, employees. And, you know, so we could see that if it started to snowball where company after company was announcing a hybrid employees would have opportunity to, if they wanted to work hybrid, they would go to those other locations. Um, and that's exactly how the things have started to play out. And I think, especially for CIOs that are on this call, what we've seen in the consulting industry is there's a tech talent war going on. And we've had um, a number of, for example, we've had some of our architects, best architects stolen by people in Silicon Valley um, because they, before they made them move from Ohio to Silicon Valley. And now they're saying, you don't have to and we'll pay you a Silicon Valley salary. And so kind of the, the world has changed here and to be competitive, um, most companies are going to have to offer um, hybrid. So with that, I'll stop and I'll go on to the next slide. Steve, there you go. So we'll, we wanted to build in a few Q and A. Um, this one might be a little bit short. We wanna stop and see if there are there, there are specific questions that we can answer right now. Um, Larry, we do have one question out there, <clears throat> and it's from David. It says, you, um, does hybrid workplace work better in a consulting company like Centric versus a manufacturing company? <clears throat> uh, so there's a, a couple of different ways to, to answer that. I think, so if you have a consulting company that is a knowledge base, um, it, absolutely, I think it is easier. But the point that we try to make and that I make in the book is even if you are a company that easily lends itself to being remote, you still want to build face-to-face -face a gathering strategy of how you get together because it reinforces those relationships that were vir built virtually and it energizes everybody. So you're going to want to build that in. And we can get into this a little bit later, but let's say you have a manufacturing um, facility, or even let's, let's take healthcare as an example, where you have uh, people that have to be on the front line um, speaking or, or, you know, caring for patients, but the admin um, does not. And so there's a worry about have and have nots, but what we're seeing in uh, one hospital system that we're working for is everybody recognized that it is a um, more cost-effective way if they get rid of a lot of their office space um, and the back office actually prefers a hybrid model. And so it is working out. And so we're seeing in most organizations, even if you have manufacturing or something that requires front line, there is some hybrid solution to the folks 
um, that have the ability to, to work remote. And we've even worked with some companies where we've worked with roles to um, design them so that people have a way to alternate um, sometimes getting remote so they can get that, they can build that into their, their job. Yeah, July, just to add a point to that, I think you, you, you highlighted some really good examples there. And the organizations we find that are most uh, confident in their ability to stay hybrid are the ones that focus on the work. And, and if the work can be effectively done remotely on a permanent basis, or does it need to be hybrid? Or quite frankly, some, some jobs just need to be on site on a regular basis. So focusing more on the work itself and the value creation for the customer, taking into account employee preference, absolutely, but really focusing on it as a business decision. We have another question here. Um, so why does it appear that CEO and other executive leaders do not see the hybrid model as a competitive advantage for talent? Uh, any insights around that? It, well, so there's, there's probably lots of ways to answer this question. I got a couple to get us started here. So when, when working with different executives and different, um, you know, Fortune 5100 companies over the past year, many of them didn't have a preference for working remotely. Quite honestly, many of them wanted to work more on site. And it took a transition for many of those leadership teams to realize that it really worked well for them. And what I, I've seen is when they feel like they personally want to work remotely, they have a lot more interest in seeing as a competitive advantage for their organization as well. Um, I think that's been improving over the past year, like maybe the past three months, it hasn't been as prominent. Um, so that's one, one factor. Um, I would add in what we've seen with um, some CEOs and executive teams is they're from an, a generation where um, they grew up this way and it is just very hard for them to envision that this could be a, a mode that you could work. And one executive would say, I used to be able to look out, out across the office on a Friday afternoon and I could feel the buzz of the office. And now when I can't see everybody, I don't know that they're not working. So it's very uncomfortable for them. And so we've had to find ways to help them learn to be comfortable. The other interesting thing that has played out is we've seen some organizations where the CEO is like, look, I, I hear you, I hear you, but we're still coming back in the office. And we've had um, organizations where their entire, like one of their entire tech teams quit the next week. And so they came back to us, they're like, uh, we need to rethink that policy. And so you've seen that with Amazon, Apple, and a number of others that took a strong stance. Um, and they've had to kind of uh, change it because they're losing folks. Is that a question of trust? Yeah. Being able to feel the buzz versus I don't know that they're working. Um, sometimes it is trust, absolutely. Um, and we can, we'll talk about that. That's kind of the foundation of a great remote or hybrid culture is, is, um, is trust. But then you start to add in things like, um, we can't innovate, um, we can't have a great culture. Uh, you know, it's, it, they're saying there's no way you can do those things. You have to have those unintentional bump ins to have innovation. Well, what we've known from doing it for 20 years is that's absolutely not the case. It can be solved. And it takes a little bit of showing them how to do that for them to get comfortable. I have a question. This is Michael Severini from Frost Brown Todd. We're a law firm headquartered here in Cincinnati. And we're moving to more of this, high, this, this hybrid approach. And this, this is something maybe you'll, you'll touch on later on. But as we are having more people coming back in the office and we're trying to navigate the logistics of having in-person meetings versus web conference meetings, what's, what we're finding is that it's too, uh, because there is no set policy of, okay, everyone's going to be in the office on this particular day. And we've got 13 offices, so that wouldn't work anyway. But what happens is, you know, we, we try scheduling a meeting that's in person, but then, you know, maybe a portion of the, the people will be actually remote on that day. So in the end, we end up just doing web conference, remaining, staying with Zoom or Teams anyway, even though, let's say, like three people on the offices next to me are all, we're all here physically in the office, but it's just easier to go back to the web conference and just do it all that way instead of trying to figure out who's in the office, who's not in the office. So that's something I'd like you to touch on later on, maybe. We, we can talk a little bit about it now. Um, so one of the things is developing um, kind of your gathering strategy um, for your individual teams and your organization. You know, when is it you get to face-to-face? -to -face? And then you're also hitting on one where we're seeing a lot of technology innovation because you want 
what you ultimately, so before the pandemic, we were all, we've all been in a conference room where somebody's on the this phone and you forget they're there um, calling in. You can't do that anymore in a hybrid environment. It has to be the exact same experience and you have to level set it so that everybody has the same experience. And so we're seeing really cool technology come out now where everybody can be in the conference room, but they show up on the screen. And, and, and so you're getting best of both worlds. And I, I think you're going to see a lot of innovation uh, around that. Um, Steve and Joe, would you guys add to that at all? Um, Larry, I was actually going to say the same thing that you said is that, um, you know, we are now transitioning from um, uh, organizations getting accustomed to having meetings as web conferences and, and when to have video on, when not to, all of that kind of stuff, to actually uh, enhancing technology that's available to improve that hybrid experience where you can have people in a meeting room and you can have people joining remotely where they, they have a better experience than what they would do than over a traditional Zoom or Teams meeting like we're doing today. So um, it's really about um, understanding what the needs are um, from, from the people in the organization and um, how you're gonna approach that hybrid, uh, that hybrid model um, from a technology standpoint to, to uh, improve that inclusivity of, of everyone who's involved. Yeah, I think the general the direction of the technology is uh, always being digital first. So even when you are having a mixed participation in person versus remote, still leading, leading with the technology. So for example, if you're going to be working on a whiteboard, you know, a physical one in a conference room, that's probably going to be a bit challenging unless you have a camera that follows, right? So then using the digital whiteboards so everyone can see that uh, embedded into whatever app you're using for collaboration, of course, but then those are just the, some of the trends of being digital first, even when in person. Larry also spoke to a gathering strategy and that's, you know, that could be by a team, you know, like your immediate directs, or it could be whatever unit you're a part of at a larger level, or it really could be your entire company if that's practical. Um, so having those, having an intentional plan, you know, probably on an annual basis, quarterly basis, look at it that way or monthly basis, on how to get back together uh, when it's safe for everyone and, and really having that personal connection in a room at the same time. And some of the guidance we, um, we, we see work well with companies is when you are coming back together to be in person, to have a very clear purpose for that gathering and a purpose that is much better accomplished when you are in person. So you wouldn't wanna have your normal, like an update meeting of some kind if you could easily do on a Zoom call or a Teams call or whatever as your primary purpose for coming together. You wanna to have some unique purpose uh, for that gathering strategy. All right, well, it feels like a good time to transition on to the next um, topic here. Hey, hey Steve, um, yeah, this, ahead, is, this, this is Dave Shardlow. I asked the previous question. First, I wanted to commend uh, Larry uh, on your all strategy over the years uh, for your consultants. Because I do think that, I, I, and I'm very familiar with Centric's uh, model as far as your consultants, uh, being able to get them off the road and that type of thing. Um, so I, I'm very familiar with that. And I think that that's really contributed to your success over the years, that work-life balance. So uh, my hat's off to you for uh, that kind of model, which has been there for a long time with you all. So just a comment and um, Thank you. Haven't, got, haven't gotten a chance to meet you, but I commend you for it. Um, it's, it's allowed you to attract top talent, I can tell you that. So um, the, um, you commented a little bit about building on the you know, manufacturing companies or other companies that do have to have people, but uh, if not now, maybe later you could comment on the haves and the have nots. You know, how do you deal with the HR issue of the people that can work hybrid and those, maybe not working on a manufacturing line, but um, that feel that need to be in the office or management does in those that are allowed to uh, uh, work hybrid. So I'm very interested in your comments on that as we go through the session. Thank you. Sounds good. All right, we'll be sure to hit that David throughout. And um, if you've got some additional questions after we do that, feel free to bring that back up and we'll, we'll uh, go a little deeper. So. All right, so let's turn our attention now to you know, away from the what and the why and into uh, more of how do you build that uh, remote hybrid culture. So again, just a quick poll question, same method here. So when you think about your uh, 
your your current transition to a hybrid, or if I think one or two of you may have already fully made that transition, what are some of the concerns that you have about a successful transition? So sustained executive support, you know, we've seen this one occasionally come up with clients. Uh, leadership ability to transition how they lead to a virtual environment. Maybe the technology isn't quite right yet, still fine tuning that. Maybe you're concerned about some of your core strengths of your culture, number four, and then actually how to collaborate. So all employees. So we've got one, two, four, five, two. Yep. Two, three, five. One, four. Okay. Excellent. So it looks like we've got um, all five pretty well represented across the group. Um, if we maybe a bit more of a focus on uh, uh, four and five. You know, I mean, from our experience, um, all five of these are watch outs for as you transition. Um, sustained executive support is, is exceptionally important. So your journey to hybrid is one that feels more like a continuous journey versus a start and stop and uh, really employees questioning the longevity of the hybrid environment, which potentially could lead to concerns and, and turnover. Um, leadership ability to lead virtually, probably one of the original challenges uh, that many organizations started working on last summer when COVID hit and still are, right? So leadership is still leadership, but it's how do you go about doing that in a more virtual environment and then now more in a hybrid environment. What does that look like for your own routines as a leader and with your teams and with your peers as leaders? Uh, a lot of new technology hitting the market too, so just keeping pace on that and what's working well. And then there's been uh, companies that are somewhat concerned about some of their core strengths. Maybe it'd be customer centric or could it be uh, innovation or operational excellence, anything like that, that they feel like they might lose that or not be able to reinforce that as much. Uh, without being in the same building at the same time. So how to do that. And then lastly, just how is everyone getting the work done together, right? Just all those practices and the policies um, and even pol and policies around technology and, and workplace tools. So I think these are the key five. Um, we're gonna jump now into the, how to build a great culture remotely. So as I mentioned, released this book about 15 months ago, and it was specifically, I looked around and there was, there were books written on how to be remote, but there were not books written about how to be remote and have a great culture. And so saw this gap in the marketplace and decided to put this out, out there. Um, this is meant to be a how-to guide. And if anybody would like a copy, happy to send it to you electronically or physically, um, just uh, shoot Steve Bernicke a, a note and I'll get it over to you. Um, all the proceeds to the, of the book do go to helping improve the digital divide, which I'm, there's a company called Launch Code, an organization that sending all the proceeds to that. Um, and it's uh, it's been great. So I'm going to, sometimes I give the talk on the book and it takes an hour and a half. I'm going to do it in about five minutes because we have a lot of other content um, to get through, but I'm just gonna give you kind of the, a taste or the highlights um, of the key concepts. Um, I saw in the uh, the poll that we just did, there's definitely a lot of questions about maintaining culture. And so hopefully I'm going to hit on some of those, um, the, there'll be some good takeaways. There's over 50 stories in the book. Many of them are embarrassing um, about how we figured out how to do this. And I'm just gonna, I only have time and I'll share uh, one here on the, on the first point. So I, I think Tracy, you brought up before uh, about trust and Absolutely, the key thing, and it's the first chapter in the book is in a remote world, world in having a great culture, you have to trust your workforce. You have to trust that they're getting the work done. And so uh, a lot of people, a lot of executives, you know, they're like, I can't see them, I can't trust that they're getting the, the work done. And, and we've worked with thousands and thousands of employees over the last 20 years. And I can count on one hand where I've had an issue of somebody not working intentionally. It is the exact opposite is what happens is people end up working too much and you have to train them to set boundaries 
uh, when they're in that home environment between work and their personal life um, because they'll get stressed out and they'll work too much. Um, and so we, we find that over and over again um, on the years, uh, over the years. So um, the other th interesting thing is we do see organizations that are installing software that monitors you know, everything that an employee is doing. Um, and so you, you know, to prove that they're working, it's taking screenshots, um, I try to coach organizations that that is the wrong approach to take because it's not an issue. People are consistently going to work hard. If you have the right measurement system in place, you can find it. And people don't feel good about it. They don't feel trusted and it doesn't build, it doesn't lend itself to a great uh, culture. So, and the last thing, make it okay. This is the one story I promised. Um, early on, we were, we were at a happy hour and we were telling, um, you know, we take calls, we allow people to take calls from anywhere. Um, you know, at business calls. And, one, and when people are sharing the story of the craziest place that they've taken calls, and this one gentleman made the mistake of sharing that um, on Friday mornings, he works out. And sometimes we have an early morning leadership call and he'll get to that call. And he has, a, if he had a meeting afterwards, he didn't have time to take a shower. So his solution would be to take the conference call in the shower. And so he would set the phone up on the ledge and, uh, you know, be listening during the shower. And of course, uh, invariably someone would call on him. So he would have to turn the shower off, um, stand there shivering, uh, answer the question, then put it back up um, on, on the ledge and finish his shower. And he made the mistake of telling us this. And so now everybody in the company makes fun of him. Uh, and uh, um, I share this story often. He's actually anonymously recognized in the book because he didn't want his name out there. So, but the point is making it okay. There, in the old world, it was, you had to be in the office and people have this mindset that it is not okay to, you know, be going to a yoga class in the middle of the day or taking my kid to the park in the afternoon. We make it completely okay. That's the advantage of remote. You want to design it so that you can have your best life and you can feel fresh and energized with however that works for you. And it doesn't have to be, you're sitting at your desk from nine to five. So that's one of the keys. The next one, training your workforce. Um, you can have the same deep level of relationships um, with anybody in a virtual world. And I would argue even better or deeper um, than if you see them physically in the office. Um, and you can lead a virtual workforce and be a great leader if you're not seeing them every day, but you have to do things differently. There are different tactics that we learned to do um, that helped us you know, lead and build those relationships. And so you know, just uh, a few examples of that is if you're a leader, you have to have much more frequent check-ins and touch points um, with those that are, that are reporting to you if they're virtual. Uh, and it's also about building a personal connection with them. And so we do things like modeling vulnerability because vulnerability is a shortcut to trust. Um, we encourage people to meet um, not just on business, but really getting to know each other. So as an example, when a new leader joins us, the first 30, 60, 90 days, we map out employees in the organization that they or other leaders that they should meet. And we want them to meet not on business, but really to build and form that relationship. And then we will get together in person at a leadership retreat. And that is the chance to reinforce those relationships that you've been built, built virtually changing your meeting structure. So the bump-ins that happen like on the way into the conference room for a meeting or at the water cooler, those do not happen obviously in a virtual world. And so you have to recreate them. And so one of the ways that we do that is we changed our meeting structure so that we have a virtual water cooler at the beginning of all of our meetings. And it is a chance, um, sometimes it's structured, sometimes it's unstructured, it has nothing to do with business. It's all about building uh, connection. Hybrid models winning out. We've talked a little bit about this. Face-to-face -face does not go away if you are in a remote world or a hybrid world. You want to design your strategy around when you get together as a company, when you get together um, as a division, when you get together as a team, when you get together one-on-one. -on -one. It still is there and it's an effective and really important part of being um, remote. And it, it just depends on your type of company. So for us, we get in the United States, we get our entire company together three times a year one of those times is just purely for fun, where we take everybody to a fun location with their significant other. Um, and, it's all, and, and it's all about building, deepening those relationships and reinforcing culture. Um, measurement, you have to have um, good measurement in place. And so there's certainly productivity measures, but then there's also um, culture measures. And so we keep, we do pulse surveys, we do anonymous surveys, and it's all about, because you can't see everybody, you want to have your your finger on the pulse of how things are going. So I can actually see by some of those survey results when we have a culture problem somewhere in the organization, even though people are virtual, I can tell it. Um, 
the biggest mistake that I made as an executive leading a virtual company was waiting too long to install great software. We were highly inefficient. Um, and so uh, it was a number of years ago, we went to Teams and 0365 and it was, it was mind blowing how much more, not only efficient we were in getting stuff done, but what I didn't realize is if you have the right technology, you can actually help build culture. Um, a couple of quick examples. So when people um, join the company, everything that, you know, all the chats, everything is a recordable history. They can see how you interact. They can see what your culture is and they learn from that. It also gives you the opportunity to um, grow um, a sense of belonging by virtual teams. So an example, all the veterans in our organization, when they join, there is a veterans team. And so it's people they already have an affinity with and J1, they join it and you know, they're making fun of the branch that they're in, that sort of thing. Um, you couldn't do that without, without the software. And then, then finally, um, which we'll get into in a little bit later, you have to have the right um, technology infrastructure to allow and enable remote work with security and um, everything else. So I know that was super, super fast. Um, happy to, we'll get into a little bit more of those, but I wanted to give you an overview of some ideas of it is certainly possible to have an amazing culture. Um, you have to just do things a little bit differently. Go to the next slide, Steve. All right, and, just um, a touch. As I say, Steve, before we jump into that, we do have another question that I think um, Larry in many ways um, relates right back to the culture conversation we were just having. So uh, the question from David is, what rules or practices for video conferences does Centric have for your company and recommendations for companies, employees like ours on the call, such as expectations to have video on or off? Yep, excellent question. It varies by company and it depends on the culture of your company, but what we have found works best for us is we, most calls, we make it optional. And the reason that we make it optional is because somebody might be driving to um, pick their kid up from work and we don't expect them to be on video. I've been at my son's golf matches um, and I've been on conference calls hiding in the trees I'm talking in a golf voice. Um, so it, it, it speaks to that making it okay and making it more flexible. Now, what, what I would say is times that we would require it is if you are having, certainly during the pandemic, if you were having a performance problem with somebody and you had to connect with them virtually, um, having those visual cues are really important because it's hard enough um, to have a hard conversation. And, but you want to have those additional. Um, so we've kind of tiered where certain situations where, but in general, we make it, um, you know, we allow people to blur their background if they don't feel like they're working in the best you know, location. So um, as much flexibility as you can provide for, for employees is usually the best answer. And um, no, they, oh, go ahead, Steve, please. Yeah, just a couple other tips there that we have found uh, works well. When you have a calendar invite for a meeting, uh, really leveraging that um, to share PowerPoint decks, agendas for that particular meeting. So you wouldn't have to do that uh, sharing through an email. You wouldn't have to do that sharing through necessarily a whole separate chat stream, but you're literally using the calendar invite. You can drop in the agenda. So you'll have all that at your fingertips, drop in any pre-reads, and all that, depending on what platform you're using, all that will go out to everybody and get messaged. And that way everything's in one place and it's actually easier to track over time. Because uh, if you have a recurring meeting, you come back to that meeting, then you've got the whole history in one place. So those are just some efficiency plays that we've been, uh, we've been using. And then uh, we encourage uh, at least uh, once a week uh, of just gathering for maybe 15, 20 minutes and not doing any business and just catching up. Uh, we've got that scheduled on a regular basis as well for our teams. And it gives people when they can make it, they show up. And when they can't, they can't, they don't. So all that's optional as well. Okay. Um, uh, so we, um, the question is around video and how often do we actually see people being on video? Um, I, I would say, you know, from the calls that I'm in internally, it's probably about 85% of the time people are sharing on video. Uh, and usually the other 15 or 20 percent, usually like what Larry mentioned, there's some reason um, why they wouldn't. Right. Joe, Larry, what, how about yourself? A um, couple of other things to think about, um, David and, and for everyone else um, is 
typically if you took a survey of your employees, what they would tell you is that being on video, especially if they're in meetings all day, every day becomes uh, exhausting, right? And so yeah. some clients of ours have gone to things like no video Fridays where um, you don't have, uh, if you do have meetings on Fridays, there's no video required. Um, many times uh, within Centric, if we're having simply an internal meeting, we don't turn video on. Um, it's really with our clients where we would do that. Um, but the other thing to be mindful of is that in a hybrid work environment where people are working from home, they may also have bandwidth limitations that make video difficult. And so um, just something to think about as an IT organization, we're going to talk about this more later, is how um, that last mile support for our employees as they're working at home. And, and for one, being somewhat empathetic, but also being mindful, but also um, in some cases, figuring out how we help them improve on that experience. And so um, just one of the other things to think about is um, uh, as you think about setting standards around video for your employees. All right, good. Keep those questions coming, we really appreciate that. So uh, I'll share a few um, highlights from a, a CHRO roundtable we established um, last summer, uh, early summer, and then how that has kind of turned into some key design decisions that, that most companies are working through when they're thinking about how to be uh, hybrid as, in, in, as part of their vision. So this first slide, uh, these five themes were very consistent. We had about 30 different companies. So this is still going on. Uh, companies like uh, REI is involved in this, um, Rite Aid, Duracell, uh, GoDaddy, LinkedIn. So a lot of different types and sizes of companies, but they are very consistent uh, challenges or things they were wanting to solve for to really help their organizations thrive in a hybrid. So we're already talking about that first one culture and, and then the policies that may go around the workforce. Uh, and that, that can cover everything from the, how to build the trust and, and, and which would look like maybe some recommendations on uh, how often leaders are having one-on-ones, how often they're having team meetings. So bringing that um, practical side in, so you have the, the familiarity and the, the shared experience with your team members to build that trust and maintain that, that connection. Uh, again, that's sort of guidance, not necessarily a policy. And that covers um, some of those fair and equitable uh, policies for the possible equipment that might be needed, like a desk or a larger monitor or multiple monitors. Most companies at this point in time have figured that out, right, and kind of have in, in the hands of their employees the right technology or at least moving that direction. So now this one's probably moving more into how do you maintain that? what new needs do employees have and how do you really kind of keep ahead of that? So quite frankly, you don't have ergonomic issues and back issues, neck issues, all those things that I don't know if anybody else has experienced some of those, but it's pretty easy to get into that mode when you're at home. Um, so everything around culture and the HR policy, being really clear on that, that starts to bring some more fairness, if you will. David, you asked earlier about the have and the have nots. I think this is part of uh, really solving for that and helping everyone in your organization to understand what is available to them, how, and, and if there are unique needs for different parts of your workforce because of the work, uh, maybe like in a call center, if you have that in your, in your organization, there might be different technology needed for people at home. Um, that could provide some better work environment than something that's not in a call center. But the reality is it's needed, right? But, and I think most employees we have found when the organization communicates the why, behind what's available for different aspects of your workforce, they understand and, you know, and they appreciate that. Uh, the second one, uh, absolutely. This, this second one of the stress and work-life balance, I saw this merge, uh, emerge, excuse me, uh, late last year and really into this first quarter of this year. And the stress of just always being on, as Joe mentioned, the stress of success too, because a, a lot of organizations have been thriving uh, during COVID, so it, the pace has accelerated, and everybody wants to keep up and keep on, keep on growing. So there's some there's a stress of success that has to be kind of taken into account how the culture would would um, allow the success to happen, but also be realistic about what's possible um, for all the employees. 
And, and then the boundaries, that's a really important topic to keep leaning into if your organization is already uh, going in that direction. That is awesome. Uh, it's a very consistent need as people are having trouble setting the boundaries. So they're just getting up, working too much, even though they have the flexibility to possibly take a break, go outside, take a break, a walk, things like that. Uh, people tend to be driven and, uh, and may not be. So we're trying to keep an eye on that within Centric. Also, many clients we've talked to are doing the same. With that comes some mental health support as well. So many organizations are increasing the focus on mindfulness, mental health options uh, through the benefit programs. We've touched on leadership and associated uh, enablement, I think, uh, in some of your questions so far, uh, but really helping leaders understand, you know, how do you build a, a feeling of stability and hope at the same time for your organization about where it's going and how everyone contributes while doing that remotely? Um, sure, we've all done it in person on a regular basis, and sometimes that's easier because of the proximity. Uh, you know, can hear what's going on and jump into the conversation. So it's the still, still the same skill set, same purpose, but doing that in a remote environment and having those one-on-ones consistent enough that you have a real good read on your team members, where they're at, how they're doing, how they're handling the, the work-life balance too, and leaning into that and asking. And then when you're on vacation, modeling actually not being plugged in and responding, right? That makes a big difference to uh, people feeling like they can have that work-life balance. Um, talent life cycle, I won't go into too much depth here, but you know, everything from uh, orientation through exit and just how to do all that in a, in a remote way. Um, obviously, um, being able to hire talent from anywhere in the US or the world if that fits your business model is a competitive advantage when you move to a hybrid organization. Some companies are leaning much more into that and really leveraging that more than others. Um, it just depends on the business model and maybe how much you've done that already. But uh, performance management is also another one that's going to be near and dear to many people's hearts trying to figure out how to do that even most effectively. That's when hybrid might really work well. Like if you're able to meet with people in person from those key conversations around talent and performance, right? Do that. If not, still not possible, that's a great time to use the video. But redesigning the process so it works effectively in the digital environment is the focus of the, of the lifecycle management right now. And then lastly, you hit on the space. Uh, there's a lot of technology embedded in this last one as well. Joe's gonna touch on that in a few more minutes. I won't go in depth in this last one. Uh, but this fifth area is, is also about the actual type of space you need. So given that you're moving to hybrid or have, you just might not need as much office space and you might not need the same type of office space. So type might be considered as like me space or we space. Me is someone's dedicated desk. We would be a conference room or just a way to gather uh, auditoriums or uh, kind of, kind of multi-purpose type rooms. So really, if you're going to keep the space, uh, some companies aren't. REI um, completely sold off all of their space. They're going to be one of the next speakers at our, at our roundtable in August. Uh, other companies are, sh are shrinking their footprint and changing to be more we space and still some dedicated me space, but only for those individuals that really must have uh, that me space on a regular basis. So again, uh, real estate um, is different for each company, how much of a big deal it is. Um, and that's always tailored uh, to their future vision of how they'd be operating. Okay. There's um, a question coming say, in. Go ahead, Larry. Yeah. Does Centric utilize employee engagement surveys to understand stress, work-life balance, pros and cons to the surveys? What do you recommend for your, to your clients? Um, so. I will answer this. We actually, so yes, you should, um, but I will expand upon it because we use a multiple, we use both surveys and in person. And so I'll give you an example of that. So certainly you want the ability to, to quickly pull, um, pull, pull people. We do an annual one that's really around all of our um, cultural um, aspects as well. But we also use what we call the voice of the employee team. And it's a rotating team of representatives um, of employees across the organization at all levels. So somebody that's just out of college to somebody that's been tenured with the organization for 15 years. And we tend to run key decisions by that group um, to make sure we're getting all the viewpoints of how it might affect people. And, um, and in fact, you know, earlier in this year, we did have a question about, hey, are we, 
Um, is everybody too stressed out? Are we going too fast? Um, and we got great, great feedback. And then the final thing I would say is if as a leader, if you are doing a good job, you should be frequently checking in with people and not just on the business, but how they're doing personally. Um, because especially during this last year, people had all reacted so much differently um, and people were really struggling. And so you want to make sure your leadership team is really closely in touch with their employees. Perfect. Let's jump to the next slide, which um, now if you think about the, the CHR roundtable conversations, um, what we've done is working with them and working with other companies, we've seen a pattern of some of the most common, I'll call them design decisions. So when you're thinking about from a senior team, thinking about how you want to operate in the future, um, it could be intentional, right? And you can, you can be very thoughtful about it, or you can sort of just um, fall into it, right? So if you want to be more intentional, these are the seven focus areas of design decisions that we have found to be the most common across, across organizations. So uh, the, the smaller boxes, the six, we've touched on some of these already, so I'll hit them high, at a high level. Starting in the top left, um, we have found that when an organization has a vision for how they want to operate in the future in a hybrid way, that the transition to it is much smoother and the alignment around it from an executive standpoint is much more consistent and reliable, if you will. Um, so there's less sort of uh, stop, starts and stops. So getting that shared, shared vision for how the organization will be working and then taking a few minutes or, you know, to really stop and think, well, what, is this, what does this mean for our people? What is this change? What do we need to help the organization with? How do we help leaders move their teams through this change? Uh, and then having some kind of, you know, strategy around that transition plan. So that's a key part. Um, another key part of, right below that is really looking at uh, what work in your organization is compatible to be permanently done remotely. Uh, and it doesn't have to be, you know, like one employee, all of their work has to be done remote or all on site. You could look at it at a more uh, detailed level and start to figure out how do we split this work up? What would that mean for when we come together and gather to get it done? Uh, so really looking at the work, thinking about employee groups, because a lot of, you know, same employees in the same employee groups probably have a shared effectiveness being remote or on site. And then what does that mean for your, your real estate, which would be move one box to the right there. So once you know what, what employees do what work and which work really can be done remotely permanently, then you've got some consistent data and decisions you can use for making the decisions around your real estate. And uh, that, that's an important decision to kind of get right because you know, it's harder to add back real estate, right? You don't want to kind of keep uh, taking away and adding it back too frequently. So really being confident in what kind of real estate footprints needed, not only for your workforce today, but also if you've got a growth plan, you're looking at, you know, growing, uh, what, what is that growth going to look like as far as employee counts and types of work and what, what your real estate needs to be to accommodate that in the near future. And then you work back up to uh, the workplace norms, and looking at how employees be working together, leaders, the gathering strategy would all fit into this, and then building the capability of leaders uh, to lead very effectively in a remote basis. And then lastly of the six then is really looking at your current uh, maturity around being able to execute your processes and your work efforts digitally. Uh, do you have some aspects of your organization still rely more on non-digital, could be processes that are very manual, very paper-driven, very proximity-driven processes. A classic example of this would be like a mail room, distributing mail internally uh, for an organization. You can move to more digitizing all the mail and then shifting all of that. You could have a smaller footprint of employees actually in person. There's many other processes, could be some of your core processes of your insurance, you know, doing the adjustments. Uh, and, and some companies have already made a lot of those transitions. You might be in great shape. Uh, in some of that space, or you might need to kind of shore that up as well. But taking a look at that and being um, proactive about that would make, make a big difference. And Joe, you want to take uh, the modern security and technology? You want to take us through that? Yeah, thanks, Steve. And <clears throat> actually extending what Steve just talked about, one of the things that we saw during the pandemic is that uh, with a lot of our clients is that um, old paper-based or manual processes that worked for well for them for years suddenly stopped working. 
um, when everyone uh, went home to work. And as organizations have adopted a permanent work from anywhere or hybrid model, that's one of the things that we've seen be a real, um, a real challenge for them is being able to um, update those uh, old manual ways of working um, to better meet the needs of the of people that are working in some sort of distributed manner, and that's not just limited to um, maybe forms or or the business workflow. Um, it's also tied to things like um, your applications and how you've enabled your applications to help people work seamlessly, regardless of where they are. And I'll give you a couple of examples there. Um, you know, <clears throat> the biggest thing we've learned, I think, uh, from IT, <clears throat> as IT people over the past year, year and a half, is that um, we've had to now uh, extend those corporate networks that we've felt comfortable with and felt secure with for years. Now we're extending those out to people's homes. And as we do that, um, what we've found is that we have some gaps in, in how people, how we've enabled people to work. Um, and again, an example of that might be where uh, you are, have enabled people to be able to do email and, and some of the have meetings and things like that fairly seamlessly, but maybe for some of your core business applications, uh, they still have to use VPN to get back to your network. Um, they may have different IDs and passwords. We have one customer uh, that we work with that has actually three different multi-factor authentication solutions. And depending on which application you're going to um, actually kicks off uh, one of those three uh, MFA solutions. And so um, figuring out how to make um, work easy from in a hybrid model, just as we've always felt like it has been from the office is really critical to be people being productive and successful. And one of the other things related to that is, is making sure that we help our employees understand when to use what as they are working. Um, again, I'll give you another example of that is we have a client who traditionally has used WebEx um, as their meeting platform. But as the pandemic grew, uh, WebEx in some cases was letting them down, let's just say. And so they decided they would go out and, and get a backup of GoToMeeting. <clears throat> so they'd sign a GoToMeeting contract also. And so, uh, and they also had Skype uh, that they had available to them and, or a Skype server from Microsoft. And so what was happening was, is that uh, employees were confused about where do I go to schedule a meeting? Where do I go to host a meeting? They even had some employees that would schedule the meeting in WebEx and then schedule the exact same meeting and go to meeting with the understanding that, well, if you can't get through to WebEx, let's jump over to go to meeting. Um, and it caused confusion amongst the employees. And so um, it's really not about, from a technology perspective, providing more tools to our employees. It's really clarifying what tools we're gonna to be supporting and uh, making sure that they adopt those in their daily work. Um, that includes um, looking at what the right mix of cloud versus on-premise is. And it's, you know, all, many of organizations uh, have on-premise applications running on servers in their data centers that perform very critical functions and will for years to come. Well, you know, obviously we can't throw those away. We can't transition those easily. And so we just simply want to make it easy for our employees to get access to those. But there might be some things like, um, just the traditional file shares that we provide all of our employees to store files. Um, if we put those behind the firewall and make people v use VPN just to get to their files, well, does that really make sense in today's world where people could be working from anywhere? And all of those things are really tied around, do we have the security we need to protect protect our identities, our devices, our applications, our data. And so probably the biggest lesson learned from a lot of organizations is um, that security posture, security model that we felt comfortable with for years for our on-premise systems and our on-premise network. Um, we really need to think differently about how we protect our digital assets, our identities and all of that. And um, really look at something like a zero trust model um, and start to transition to that as a way to make sure our identities, our data, our applications, our devices are all secure. And um, that all leads down to, uh, obviously it falls on IT <clears throat> to, support all, to support all of that. 
And another change that we've seen that, that really requires some thought is how do we have to change our IT support model to address the needs of a hybrid workforce? And that could be um, just simply uh, a better understanding of where people are working and what challenges they might have if they're working remote. But it could also be uh, if we have employees working from home where they have low bandwidth constraints, uh, maybe helping them either with uh, with uh, improve, in increasing bandwidth or helping them um, function in ways that can reduce their bandwidth requirements. Um, and uh, so we've seen a lot of organizations that have struggled with um, how to provide IT support for people who no longer are sitting in a cubicle or in an office in our building. Um, and it's a real challenge. And uh, it's put a lot of stress under I, on IT organizations, um, but it really does require some, some new thinking about how we provide support and what our employees' needs are from a support standpoint. Those are just some of the things that we've identified from a technology perspective that require some, some thought, and maybe some changes on how we've done things traditionally. Um, and even as a remote company, so, um, you know, as Larry's talked about for the last 20 years, you know, we were challenged even by some of those things because, you know, we went from a majority of our workforce working remotely to basically all of our workforce working remotely. And so we've had to go through some of these challenges ourselves. Steve, I believe it's all right. Uh, yeah, well, let's stay on that last slide for a few minutes here. We want to pause and and see what questions are out there. So we just wrapped up the uh, how to build a great hybrid culture. Any questions? Nope. All right. Well, we'll keep going then. So this next section is really more about um, transitioning to a hybrid. Uh, so this last section was more about what are some of the design decisions you, you kind of want to intentionally make either as a vision or over time. This next section is, well, how do you actually get there? Is there um, some, some orderly way to do this? Or is it sort of just uh, start and, and improve as you go? being more by design versus um, by default. So if you go to the next slide, this is an approach um, starting there with Envision all the way through implementation that kind of gives some order and sequence to um, those design decisions and also bringing those design decisions to life. So starting off uh, with uh, Envision number one, they're really looking at the current state. I mean, all of you have been working remotely uh, since COVID hit, maybe even before then in certain pockets. So understanding how well that's been working, what hasn't been working, uh, spotlighting some of that, learning from that, and also looking at that work mode compatibility. It's another key part of it. That could be formal, that could be you know, even fairly informal if you need to kind of go on the informal side. And using all of that to start to, to shape up what is our vision for how we wanna work. Uh, so that covers the people, uh, technology, process, how's information accessed and shared, um, service of customers, you know, there's certain aspects of how you do that that need to be maintained differently in the future than, uh, than going completely remotely. And really kind of getting the decision-making group, a lot of companies have steer codes on this now. Uh, many use the executive team to make these decisions and really facilitating alignment uh, of that as a vision. And then moving into making it happen into the define stage and the prepare stage. So this is where you get into fleshing out all the HR policies, and those are not one and done. I think as we all grow and learn and adapt to how we work remotely and virtually, uh, policies are just gonna have to be updated and maintained. Um, the operating norms, so we touched on operating norms earlier as an example, like the, the habits you might have for a meeting. Uh, video, no video, uh, which technologies you're using, how do you keep notes, doing whiteboarding. There are other um, operating norms too, uh, that are important to lay out for an organization. Uh, that could be how groups are coming together, gathering strategy, could be leaders um, working with their teams one-on-ones. So it's, it's, it's pulling all that together. None of that sounds daunting if, it's, it's, if you're doing it with your own team of you know, 15 to 20, 
But if you're trying to orchestrate that across a, a footprint of maybe 10,000 employees or even 3,000 or 5,000 employees, and everyone's doing it differently, that, that tends to be sort of a rough experience. So having some commonality where commonality makes sense across your organization around those operating norms is something that can be leaned into and defined. Uh, and also thinking through the business impacts, Joe just shared some examples uh, of the digital processes and also the technology. So looking at the impacts of being fully remote, what do you need to do? That can lead nicely into having a set of initiatives to actually move into preparation. So initiatives could look like writing the policies, getting the right tech in place, getting the security in place, getting the right norms up and running, could be preparing the learning to help your organization lead virtually. Laying that out, get it going, get it resourced and staffed. Um, and if you do have a need for learning, kind of getting the right learning resources in leaders' hands to lead their teams and also employees for that collaboration and expectations for how they'd be collaborating. There could be some other specific impacts to jobs. Um, we've seen client redesign jobs to accommodate more people being able to be remote uh, more often. Uh, so that's an example of trying to just shifting and sharing the work differently among jobs. Or it could be that you had to add new jobs uh, because of being remote. That isn't always the case, but depending on your specific uh, business model, that might make sense. Or even looking at structure changes, like how many direct reports, uh, where are people reporting, um, decision-making authority and empowerment could be uh, shifting naturally by being remote. So kind of moving into some of that and thinking through how to do that uh, literally could also be part of that, that prepare stage. And then implementation, uh, this is gonna be a more of an iterative style implementation for this kind of transition, not a uh, sort of a go live all at once, obviously. Uh, but start typically with preparing leaders and teams to move into that permanent uh, hybrid, get the gathering strategy in place, and then start layering in any of the initiatives as they are ready to be deployed, the new technologies, operating norms, um, anything along those lines. Location changes if you're shutting some down, opening new ones, changing the workspaces, all that would be occurring through that uh, implementation phase. So as you can see, I mean, this, this type of business shift is, is like others in the past, right? It's having a clear vision, fleshing it out so you know what it is you're moving to, how to get there, and then continually implementing, implementing it and reinforcing that change so it has some sustainability over time. So I'll do one more slide and then we'll open it up for overall general Q&A. Uh, so if, you want, if, you, if you're thinking about, well, what could um, a continuum look like of, of being fully remote and enabled on the right versus we haven't been enabled, we haven't been working um, remotely or virtually very well. So this is just the framework. I won't, I won't drain this, but you can see kind of the common categories that you typically have in an organization on the left. Uh, from your customer experience and really how to kind of preserve and maintain the excellence that you already have there. And then how do you configure your organization internally to deliver that? Everything from people process, tech information, and uh, just how the organization's set up to operate and design. So all that could be tweaked um, to be more of a, a thriving hybrid organization. And uh, there's lots more detail behind this we often share. Uh, with some clients, but um, this just gives you a kind of a good base of what that, that transition would look like. So with that, we'd like to just open it up for overall general Q&A. Um, reactions, comments are perfectly fine. Questions, anything goes. Well, probably most anything goes. Steve, I, I did want to make sure, did we address the, I think Dave had a question around the have and have nots. Did we, did we address that? Yep, Dave says thumbs up on that. Okay. Good. This is a, some great information. I know we've got some folks that are on the call via phone, so I'm not sure that they've been able to see um, the visual we have up. And there's obviously a lot of detail on some of these slides. We have recorded this and we'll make the recording available in the next several days. So people will be able to go back and reference both the great discussion and the material that you have here. Excellent. Seeing other questions right now? I do have uh, one question. This is on, on tenor. Um, 
what would you say are some key alarms for companies to not go uh, to a hybrid uh, model based on culture or how the company operates? Well, one that comes to mind would be definitely a watch out for if you've got a very toxic culture, where there's a lot of backstabbing and political challenges and just um, people aren't really supporting each other. I would think going into a remote environment could isolate people a bit more and could lead to more fear-based culture, which then could um, magnify that toxic side of the culture. Uh, so that's all very extreme language, right? So maybe you can modify that a bit and think if you've got some business units that um, maybe have a little too much infighting, they're not really collaborating as much as they could. I think if they're going to go remote, you want to do some additional support with them around collaboration, communication, trust. What is it? How do you communicate effectively to different people? And even if they're running into conflict, how might you use like models like uh, you know, constructive conflict models of choice, which everyone's might be out there. Crucial conversations is a great one uh, just to help people with that kind of uh, challenge. But I think that's a watch out. And then I think going overly remote, like if your business model really does require uh, people to be on site um, because of the work. And then if you say, well, they have a preference, employees have a preference to go fully remote, let's go ahead and try it. I'd say be very careful about that and probably even you know, start a little slower on that, like maybe half and half remote or different jobs remote and then move fully into remote if it's going well. Um, so just those are two factors. Steve, I'd like to add a couple more to that is um, a couple from a technology perspective is if, you're, if your organization's unwilling or unable to provide um, your employees with the tools they need to efficiently work um, in a remote or hybrid manner. That's one. Um, but re somewhat related to that is if, if you're unwilling or unable to uh, change the way you think about security of your uh, digital assets and your identities in your organization, and you're bound to um, whatever your legacy is in that regard, that would be another factor that would limit your ability to, to go to hybrid. You know, another factor that would limit your effectiveness being hybrid is if your leaders across the organization um, are dragging their feet to, to lean into leading virtually and making the, uh, adapting the way that they need to. Because uh, that'll have a ripple effect across your organization on engagement, turnover, cost of operations, so that leading virtually is really a, a lever, it needs to be pulled. I've got a question for all of you, this is David, that uh, do you find that this discussion of hybrid, uh, remote becomes an initiative in itself or is it part of a larger quote unquote digital transformation? And, and boy, I, I look at that term of digital transformation as a, as a quite honestly, a consulting buzzword. Um, but um, the question, you know, I have is, is this under a broader strategic plan or is it uh, so important because of the pandemic that it becomes uh, an immediate, hey, it's an, an initiative in itself? Wow. Wow. Um... So a couple of different, it's different in every organization, um, but point number one would be, um, hopefully you've seen from this, it is not, if you just gave it to the CHRO or you just gave it to the CIO, you're gonna have a hard time being successful. It, it touches all aspects of your organization. And so you should put it into one initiative if you're ultimately going to be um, successful. Uh, we often see, um, like if, if you have a transformation office, this would be one of those transformations that, that, it, that they are running and it's run at that kind of PMO um, type level. Um, and then I would say in a lot of organizations, it's forced, the pandemic has forced, you know, people um, adopted, customers adopted all digital channels. And then um, all the organizations had to learn to adopt hybrid and, Every organization now is a technology company. And so we're seeing 
whether you call it digital transformation or not, it's probably a series of major initiatives that need to be managed at the company level um, for the company to transform. I don't know, Joe and Steve, would you add to that? I would agree with that, Larry. And I, I think from a, think about it from a human resources standpoint, um, take that lens for a minute. Uh, if your organization does an, some type of engagement survey or pulse or something like those, something like that, I think uh, this transition and how people are operating in a hybrid world needs to be incorporated into how those talent processes are sensing the employee experience. So, so if you do it as a separate, right, even the transformation officer, you got to really embed it, particularly around your talent processes, because that's going to be uh, even more critical. And David, I don't know if this directly answers your question, but whether you call it digital transformation or not, what we've seen from a lot of IT organizations is they've had to reprioritize um, what the next year or two looks like and um, shift budgets around and uh, it's, it's been a challenge for them, right? Because um, in some of what it means is putting more focus on those things your employees touch every day um, and less on maybe some of those um, legacy systems or, or um, line of business systems that we all have in our IT plans, you know, to do things to on a regular basis. So it's caused a real shift. And it's also caused a shift then in some of, of how we you leverage our IT team, our IT staff, right? Challenging people to take on new, some, develop some new expertise and take on some new um, roles or, or learn new capabilities. Uh, thank you very much. I know that uh, uh, another additional question would be almost all of our membership is small to medium business. And um, Steve Bernanke is very aware of that. And what comments would you make to those of us that are in decidedly that smaller, you know, small to medium business uh, in regards to a lot of things we've talked about in this? Could you be, you know, maybe a little specific to that uh, portion uh, of our membership? Mm -hmm. Um, I can uh, I can start with that because I've got a real easy one, David, and I touched on it already. And I don't want to sound like a broken record, but one of the things that we've seen and and um, Larry and I exchanged some information on this not too long ago is that um, as organizations have gone to a more remote working model, they have opened themselves up to more cyber threats, and um, small to medium businesses have actually become the target for those threats more so than the ones we hear about like Colonial Pipeline and all of that, right? Those small to me, because it's perceived that small to medium business has less resources in place to block um, uh, whether it's ransomware attacks, uh, uh, spam, phishing, whatever it is. And so um, the real, one of the real challenges we've seen in small and medium business is how do we get the right security in place to allow our employees to securely work in a remote manner that doesn't put us in a compromising position? So that's one of them. Thank you. Okay. I, I would just add the, the concepts that we're talking about could app, they, could, they apply to small, medium, and large businesses. You can operate a hybrid model, a remote model. And in fact, most of the startups today are taking advantage of this. Mm -hmm. So many of the startups, they're hiring from everywhere in the world. They're using freelancers. Um, they have no office space and everything's in the cloud. So they're actually much more nimble um, against the more established organizations. So in some cases, it's an advantage. So there, I would say there's no reason that, uh, depending on the size of your organization, that you could not be a fully hybrid um, organization. Yeah, we found that to be true, David, because we've worked with companies that's like 100 people uh, and helped them through transitions and then others that are thousands. Um, so it, it's, it's interesting, but it's a lot of the same challenges, regardless of employee size. Thank you. I'll make a quick comment here. This is Kathy. Um, I think the whole uh, sending everybody out and working from home and, and we're now dealing with, okay, now they're coming back into a hybrid environment where we do have some in the office and some not. 
this comment may be too far down in the weeds, but I think it's valuable to the folks on this call because we are smaller businesses. We're not that big. We have to look at things very differently. Um, we just had our equipment in house in our conference rooms. You know, it didn't work with Teams. Teams is now our platform. It, it worked with a, a, a specific type of meeting that we had before. And in talking to vendors, they wanted this huge, let's replace it all. Let's put all brand new equipment in. Well, we've got all these initiatives going on. We can't really do that. Come to find out if you ask them and you really talk to them, a lot of these organizations have a little add-on or a little piece you can add to your system to now allow teams to work on all your current older equipment and everything that you're doing. So when you start talking about transitioning your back in for some folks where you're half in a conference room and you're half out, be sure to ask your vendors, do they have those pieces? Because yes, they have a brand new system to sell you, but they also have, oh, you can just buy this little, you know, $1,100 piece of software and use what you currently have. So 